initiative uh, and sponsored, of course, by the Latino Research and Policy Center at the Colorado School of Public Health. I'm pleased to have the honor of uh, introducing uh, Dr. Carlos uh, Del Rio. I'm not sure how when I first met Carlos, but it's been uh, a long time and uh, I've watched his activities over the years and we share many uh, close friends in uh, Mexico where Carlos uh, is from and went to medical school. His uh, professional career has been uh, largely, uh, but not exclusively at um, Emory uh, University where he is currently distinguished uh, professor and also executive associate dean for Emory at uh, Grady. His uh, research uh, and practice have uh, spanned a broad range, but given emphasis to HIV uh, infection uh, and its course, access to care, antiretrovirals, and prevention. He's worked um, internationally. He uh, has been honored by election to the National Academy of Medicine, and just this year became Foreign Secretary of the uh, National Academy of Medicine. Uh, I have heard and uh, read many things that uh, Carlos has said over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me say that he's been a wise and sometimes courageous voice on uh, a set of very uh, important uh, issues, as we all know. Uh, his talk uh, today is entitled The Impact of COVID-19 on Latinos. Carlos, bienvenidos. And, uh, we are looking forward to your uh, lecture. Well, thank you, John, and uh, thanks to uh, to everybody at uh, at UC Colorado and the and the Latino certificate for the invitation. I think it's a, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, let me just say that uh, Fernando Holguin, who invited me, uh, we went to the same medical school uh, some years apart, but we are are friends and have known each other for quite some time. So. I feel like a lot of friends are in Colorado and, and I, I feel a, a significant uh, appreciation for the work that is being done there. Uh, you know, Carlos Franco is somebody that I trained, was actually my chief resident. And, uh, and I, I have really had a lot of impact in his career. And so, you know, Shanta, Shimmer and many other people out there. So it's a big piece of Emory and therefore a big piece of my heart over there in Colorado. Plus I love to ski. so. Uh, so that makes Colorado particularly special for me. I, I'm actually a big fan of going to Copper Mountain, uh, <clears throat> where I spent a lot of uh, Easter uh, breaks with my kids when they were growing up. So I'm going to talk to you about health disparities in COVID-19. And uh, I, I, well, I think we need to start by talking about what, what we mean by health disparities. And if you look at Healthy People 2020, health disparities is something that adversely affects a group of people who have systematically experienced greater social or economic obstacles to health. And I think that definition is very important because it really highlights what we mean when we talk about health disparities. So throughout this talk, I'll tell you a little bit about health disparities uh, related to gender and COVID, talk about racial and ethnic disparities, uh, make a correlation between the social determinants of, with social determinants of health, and then acknowledge what I think is really important is that we acknowledge the role of structural racism in the COVID disparities and then talk about a way forward. Uh, let's start by mentioning gender disparities. Uh, several studies uh, suggest that men with COVID do less well than women. And there seems to be a higher fatality rate. And this is not new. This was also seen with, with SARS and with MERS in which men had a higher fatality rate than women. And one hypothesis has been that estrogens are actually protective. And others have suggested that this has to do with higher concentration of ACE2 receptors expressed in men. But it may be just lifestyle differences. You know, men smoke more than women and other things that, that may be. So biology uh, or, or, or social environment is, is always a question. And as you can see in, in this infographic, you know, yes, there is a higher mortality in men, but there's also higher prevalence of pre-existing conditions such as ischemic heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, chronic renal disease. There's also higher uh, prevalence of high risk behaviors in men such as less social isolation, more smoking and alcohol use, more occupations with, with high risk exposures. Uh, and then there's maybe biological difference. So the reality is we're not totally sure. 
But what is clear is that this uh, gap in mortality, this gender gap in mortality is not exclusive of the, of the United States. But as you can see in this graph, no matter which country you're looking at, mortality in, in males, which is here in, in blue, is higher than females, which is here in gray. And you can see for, for females, for males, it could be you know, one and a half to two times higher. Now, as, as this data from, uh, from Kaiser Family Foundation shows, we're not clear if this is due to you know, social determinants. Men are, are less likely to stay at home, are more likely to not shelter in place, so it may be biology, it may be uh, uh, behavior that is changing this. Now let's move on to racial and ethnic inequalities. I think if you're gonna read one thing, I would suggest you read this New York Times article published on July 5th, which still continues to be very, very relevant. And you can see here and then in COVID-19, uh, the, the, the incidence in whites was, is, is 23 per 10,000 population while in Blacks is 62 per 10,000, and in Latinos is 73 per 10,000 population. In addition to that, what you see is when you break down this by age, you see that in, in, in Whites, the big increase in, in, in incidence starts at age uh, 80. That's where you have the big increase. But if you look at Blacks, and particularly when you look at Latinos, you really see that big increase starting really at age 20. You can see that tremendous increase in, in higher incidence starting at age 20 across the age group. If you look at hospitalizations and you look at age-adjusted uh, hospitalizations by race, race ethnicity, you can see that for uh, non-Hispanic whites, we see only uh, 73 hospitalizations per 100,000 population. Well, if you look at non-Hispanic Indian or Native Americans, you look at non-Hispanic Blacks or you look at Hispanics, you see over 300 hospitalizations per 100,000 populations. And in fact, here in my state in Georgia, we have documented this very nicely. You can see here that we don't have a huge Hispanic community in Georgia, but, but you know, incidence for Hispanics is, is over two, almost 3,000 per 100,000 populations, and you could see Hispanics here in yellow, while Blacks, which are you know, much more prevalent in Georgia, only is about, it's about 1,600 per 100,000 population. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at mortality, if you look at deaths, then mortality is a lot higher for African-Americans compared to other ethnic groups, including Hispanics, which is only a 26 per 100,000 population. So you can see a much higher prevalence of disease, incidence of disease, and a much lower mortality in Hispanics. So it's not just, oh, more disease, more mortality. There's some difference here that obviously needs to be further understood. But what is very clear is that in Atlanta, black patients with COVID are more likely to be hospitalized than white patients. And in fact, black, the mortality for blacks is really particularly significant. And black people are dying at two and a half times the rate of white people from COVID-19. And almost one in five black adults actually know somebody who's died of COVID-19 today. But if you look at, at the data combined, you can see that whether you're talking about Blacks, Latinos, you know, all, all ethnic minorities, if they had died at the same rate as whites, there'll be about 20,000 Blacks, about 10,000 Latinos, and about 600 Indigenous people still alive today. So clearly, the difference in mortality, the difference in, in, in incidence is, is significant in Hisp Hispanics. The different mortality is very, very high for Blacks. <laughs> And you can see that this is a very nice infographic. And if you're going to remember one slide, this is the one I would remember. CDC, this is very nice infographic showing that, you know, cases, whether you're talking about Indian and Native Americans, you're talking about Asian American, you're talking about Blacks or Hispanics, it's about two and a half to three times higher the, the number of cases, hospitalizations, much, much higher again. But it's the death that is really driving a lot higher in, 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 in black uh, populations compared to uh, Af the other populations. And in fact, in Hispanics, you see it's only 1 point time, 1.1 times higher than in, 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 in whites. Now, the one thing that is very interesting is this study. And this study showed that, this study from New York showed that once people get to the healthcare system, there's no difference in mortality. And this report suggests that that black patients who are able to access the healthcare system have no difference in mortality compared to whites. So in other words, access to healthcare makes 
makes a huge difference. This data also from uh, from black patients shows that you know that really counties that have a high proportion of black patients are in fact where all, all the cases are in, are concentrated in blacks. But these disparities are not alone explained for healthcare access or other things. Now, speaking about Hispanics, I think this is an article that you all need to look at. This is really a critical article by Carlos Rodriguez and several uh, looking at, they look at COVID and they divided the population in places that have less than 17.8% of the population being Latino to places that have more than 17.8% of the population being Latino. And you can obviously see Colorado there having a much more higher percentage of population being Latino compared to, for example, here in Georgia, that we are in the less than 17.8%. But COVID-19 diagnosis among Hispanics were much greater in, in counties that had a 7.8% or greater Latino population. In fact, 90.9 .9 per 100,000 versus 82 per, per 100,000. And COVID-19 deaths were greater in Midwestern Latino counties. Then when you look at what factors are determining that, COVID-19 diagnoses were associated with counties with greater monolingual Spanish speakers, with greater heart disease deaths, and with less social distancing. While great COVID-19 deaths among Hispanics were associated with household, with household occupancy density, with elevated air pollution, and higher unemployment rates. Now, furthermore, if you look at this, here's we're looking at COVID cases and urbanicity and you can look at black versus Latinos. And you can see here that in black, for blacks, no matter whether you're talking about large metro areas or medium metro areas or non-metro areas, cases COVID-19 is higher in blacks with more black residents, no matter what type of, 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 of living, of city living size. But when you're looking at Hispanics, COVID-19 cases are higher in counties with more Latino residents in medium metro to rural areas. So it's the Latinos living in rural and sort of small metro areas that have the really high incidence of mortality. Latinos living in high, in big metro areas, New York and others really have no difference. So again, we really need, this is more than just race. And I think we really need to understand this further. I think furthermore, when you look at this data, it's very clear that cases in Hispanics soared after the economy reopened. And I think we can see very clearly the first wave of the disease was primarily white. And then the economy, we closed the country and then the economy opened. And then we saw the rush in Hispanic patients. And what was, why was that? Well, because most of those Latinos were frontline workers that could not stay at home. And therefore the, so, the exposure is what really drove the epidemic. And in fact, this shows it very nicely. This shows that, you know, in communities, whether you're in the South or in the West or in Northwest, West, in those places that had a high percentage of the population being Hispanic, the moment the economy opened, the cases in Latinos soared, while the cases in Black and Whites did not soar when the economy opened. So very clearly, it was the opening of the economy. It was those Latinos that were working in restaurants and in frontline employments that actually drove the disease incidents. Now, what are the reasons for this ethnic disparities? Is this disproportionate burden of comorbidities? Or is this poor people in urban settings living in more crowded conditions that are more likely to be employed in, in public facing occupations that prevent physical distancing? I think one of the things you need to think about is, segre is residential segregation. And in the setting of a pandemic, conditions in which you leave, live and work are primarily, primarily the factors impacting exposure to disease. And in fact, Black and Latinx populations tend to live in segregated and poor neighborhoods. And whether it's through unfair lending, through red line districting, through Black busting, all those things are driving Black and Latinos living in less, in, in segregated neighborhoods, in crowded conditions, and that, that is, what driving, is what drives the disease. Because they tend to live in higher density areas, which makes social distancing more difficult. And they also have access to hospitals with fewer technological resources, fewer specialists, less board certified physicians, and higher rate of, of, of neglect, no, negligent adverse events. Then finally, for blacks, there's obviously the risk of imprisonment. And the risk of imprisonment is strongly related to educational attainment, as well as race. 
So here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is, this is New York, and you can look at different zip codes here, and you can use that, look at the prevalence of COVID in different zip codes. And there's one zip code there that I'm pointing to your attention, 11368, where 51% of the population is coronavirus positive. They had the disease. And what characterizes that zip code? Well, it's also the zip code where the median earnings is only $30,000 a year, which is the fourth shortest, fourth smallest median earning of any of the other zip codes in the area. So in other words, poverty is what dr is driving COVID-19. Further, I wanna point this article in, in, in Health Affairs that look at, looks at COVID and race ethnicity disparities. And what you can see very clearly here is one of the drivers of COVID is whether you're able to isolate at home, able to work remotely. And you can see that the percent of households where at least one person cannot work remotely it's almost 65% among Latinos. It's only 56% for Blacks and 46% for Whites. So Latinos are disproportionately impacted by living in crowded housing, multi-generational housing, and also where somebody in the house is unable to work remotely, has to go to work, gets exposed, brings the disease home, and infects others. Mary Bassett has put it this very nicely by saying, the focus on comorbidities makes me angry because it's really it's about who who still has to leave their home to go to work, who has to leave in a crowded apartment, get on crowded transportation, and go to crowded workspace for places. And we don't just acknowledge this, those of us who have the privilege of, of continuing to work from our homes and are facing those risks. And I think we need to remember this. When we think about these issues, we really have to think about housing, we have to think about employment, we have to think about the risks that we get exposed to and that others don't. Now, obviously, it, it goes down to social determinants of health. And you can see very clearly here is that, you know, when you look at underlying health conditions or you look at poverty or you look at employment or insured, a lot of these diseases cluster in the South, which is not surprising that therefore that is where the highest percentage of Blacks are dying from, from COVID-19. COVID-19 also, we have not done a good job posting testing in the locations necessary. We posted look, a lot of testing, but the testing has not been in the right places. And you can see that in many sites, you know, you're not doing enough COVID testing in poor neighborhoods or you're doing drive through testing, which means people have to get out of a car. And that obviously drives a lot of the inequalities. Now, one of the things that happens is, again, when the unemployment, when the economy opens, you also see higher economic impact in some communities like the black community, which have had more unemployment as a result of COVID. Black uh, people have braced you know, for mass evictions from apartments, et cetera. But racial inequalities, we must remember in US healthcare have not, are not new, have only been intensified by this pandemic. And again, I'll put you one example. This is an article in the Annals of Internal Medicine 10 years ago. Well, well, actually, recently, but for looking at the at the uh, 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 2009 H1N1 pandemic of 2019, you know, over 10 years ago, and you can see that we see the exact same disparities in disease affecting mostly Blacks, mostly Hispanics. So we saw these disparities before in a respiratory pandemic. We just didn't do anything about it. And the reason is this, that race is a fundamental cause of COVID-19 outcomes because race drives socioeconomic resources, social resources, healthcare resources. This leads to increased risk of exposure. This leads to increased risk of complications. And if you factor in racism, that leads to worse COVID-19 outcomes, more infections and more deaths. So I think at the center of this is also the role of structural racism in this process. So we can say that yes, racial and ethnic disparities in COVID exist. People of color are experiencing a disproportionate burden of COVID cases and deaths. Cases and deaths are concentrated in areas with higher uh, rates of uh, shares of black and Hispanic residents. And disparities in COVID-19 deaths for people of color persist across age groups and people of color experience more deaths among younger people than white individuals. But is this race? Is this color of the skin or is this racism? And as this uh, JAMA and Edward Open commentary says, structural racism is the driving force behind the disparities. 
It is a differential quality and distribution of housing, transportation, economic opportunities, education, food, air quality, and healthcare that is driving these disparities. And the concentrated harm of the pandemic has also been exacerbated by disparities in income. And the policy measures to increase healthcare access may help. And as we saw, you know, you get better, if you get to the hospital, you're gonna do fine. But a structural component has to be identified. And we really cannot treat out of this, ourselves out of this public health crisis just by, by equalizing outcomes in the hospital. And this is why I recommend you read this editorial, this general viewpoint by Williams and Cooper talking about new kind of herd immunity. And what they mention is that the silver lining of the COVID-19 pandemic is that this is an opportunity to finally eliminate inequalities in healthcare. And they propose what they call a new kind of herd immunity. Think about it, if we were able to provide people with housing, with, with good employment, with a way that they can get PPE, everybody would be protected. This is herd immunity. And in fact, our ability to defeat COVID-19 depends on our willingness to fight and defeat the pandemic of social determinants of health and racism. And I would say that health equity is the road to ending COVID-19. So the end of COVID, to ending COVID-19 is not a vaccine. The end of COVID-19 is through health equity and a health equity approach to life. And then with that, I'll end. I'll, I want to acknowledge Julius Wilder at Duke, Gregorio Millet, who's at Amphor, and Wendy Armstrong, who's here at Emory, who have given me slides or ideas for this talk. And now I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you guys have. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so we will take questions. Um, since we have a sizable group, if you could please uh, type up your questions in the chat box and we will um, read them to Dr. Del Rio. Um, so while we're waiting for them to start, I have a question. We're, we're hearing more about the long haulers, the COVID long haulers, and given that differential access to healthcare I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think will happen in terms of the persistent and the long-term effects of COVID. Uh, so, so, so this is this is really important. I mean, clearly there are. It, it is seems it's increasingly apparent. Again, first of all, it's hard to talk about long-term consequences of COVID when this is a brand new disease, right? It's very hard to talk about long-term consequences on something that is not new. Having said that. I think we, it's, it's being increasingly clear uh, that, uh, uh, that there is something related to long-term consequence of COVID and, and that, uh, that certain organs like, like the lungs, uh, the heart, and the brain are particularly heavily impacted and affected. And in fact, I'm going to put here in the chat, uh, I recently wrote a JAMA viewpoint about this that I wanted to take a look at. But the reality is that, to me, the biggest long-term consequence of COVID is a mental health consequence. Uh, and the fact that people are being left without employment. That, so I think we're going to have a mental health crisis in our hands as a result of COVID. And I see that as the biggest long-term consequence. Now, some of the other consequences are true. but you know, they're probably not very common, but again, when you have millions of people infected, they're gonna be a problem. So we need to understand them better. We also need to understand the definition. We need to understand the epidemiology. So I think it's not, it's not that clear, right? Uh, so one of the questions here is, so there's a question here about what's the appetite for systemic change where those in power are not directly impacted. Well, you know, those in power are directly impacted. Don't you know? Did you not see the president and several other people in power getting infected? I mean, clearly people in power are getting infected and they got infected because maybe somebody that served them got infected. And again, we are, we don't live in a bubble. We live together. We live, we go to restaurants, we go to, so I think that's the beauty about this. I think we got, we, it would finally be hit us that we need to improve everybody's well-being to protect ourselves. It's very different from HIV, right? With HIV, you can say, I don't have sex with those people. But here, it's actually, you're breathing the same air. You're, you're sharing environment. I think it's a little different. I mean, at least it's my hope. Uh, 
I think that there are a couple of questions uh, on the power and the decision making and uh, those, um, what is the break point to, um, to move from this inequity? Uh, I think that we are going a little bit in circles with uh, people commenting on that. Uh, I'll pass to the next one. Um, so um, here, Rosario Medina is saying that the politics affect uh, health disparities, but how do we advocate and work to towards bipartisan? So, so there's, there's two ways to affect health disparities. One of them is called voting that hopefully everybody's doing. But the other one is actually called advocacy. And I think one thing that people in public health need to learn is how to talk to politicians, how to go meet with Congress, how to go meet with your local legislator, how to educate politicians, how to, how to be politically active and involved in, with decision makers. Because, you know, writing a, a paper in, in JAMA or American Journal of Public Health is, is good for your academic career, but they're not read by the politicians. They're not read by the decision makers. You need to be able to go and talk to them. You need to be able to communicate with them. You need to be able to, 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 to engage it with people at that level. The other thing is that, the other thing that, you know, you need to realize is that a lot of it is, is just what, how you educate community and getting out to the community and talking to the community. I think it's a really important, I think empowering communities is something that we in public health do and need to learn how to do. When I think about, for example, I mean, how do we, how do we get people to stop smoking? Yes, it was legislation, it was a bunch of things, but eventually it was community pressure. It was, it was peer pressure. It was people saying, you know, smoking is not nice. I mean, there was a way to get that community pressure to actually build and create change. Uh, so somebody's asking here about vaccines, how are they gonna be distributed? What I would say is if you think, if you're really interested in reading about vaccines and, and COVID-19 distribution, I would encourage you to look at the National Academy of, of uh, Science uh, COVID vaccine allocation report. This was a fantastic report, a framework for equitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. And this really was, it's a fantastic report that was co-chaired by two amazing people, you know, two heroes in public health, Bill Fage and, and Helene Gale. And it's, it's an incredible report that I really recommend you look at because they did this report from a health equity focus. That's the driving force behind it. And they were so good that they even, you'll see a table, they even created what they called phases of vaccine. And Bill Fage said, you know, we're not gonna call it tiers because tier means there's somebody above you, somebody below you. It means classes. We're gonna talk about phases. Everybody's gonna have access, but at different phases. So I would really encourage you to look at that at that report, it's really fantastic and you can download it for free. And I put the, the link to the report there online. Thank you so much. Dr. Lee Newman had a question about steps that employers should take given that many Latinx um, individuals are working in precarious jobs. So, you know, myself and others have been involved with many of the employers. I've also been involved in employers here in Georgia, for example, working with the with the chicken industry where a lot of Hispanics work. You know, it was a matter of talking to the employees. No employee, employer wants their employees to be sick because you don't want absenteeism. And the minute we talked to them, they, they immediately provided PPE and they even put, you know, uh, you know, plexiglass shields whenever possible. They gave them goggles, they gave them face shields because again, they understood what the issues are. So part of it again is going and talking to the employers and saying, hey, the most important, and again, this is, you know, we created a false dichotomy in this narrative. We said it's public health or the economy. And what we need to say is no, in order to have a healthy economy, you need public health. So in order to have working employees, if your employees are sick, whether the economy is empty or not, you're not gonna have a business. If you wanna have healthy employees, you need to protect them. And we've done that very well in healthcare, right? In healthcare, we've given everybody masks and face shields and all sorts of things. And the, the, the COVID transmission in healthcare has mainly stopped. But again, it's all about protecting your employees. So I think talking about employers and saying, protecting your employees is actually the way to save your business. It's actually to keep your business going. You need healthy employees. So we made this mistake and I think we need to talk in public health and how 
is not economy versus public health. It's actually public health, strong, healthy population being the foundation of a healthy economy. And talking about public health, here is a different um, question, but are uh, related that many of the Latinx community members are falling in the trap uh, of the belief that the COVID-19 is a myth. And maybe it's a, that is the information is not linguistically appropriate to them or from the public health institutions. And what are the strategies that you have seen to remedy this? So that's a really good question. Yes, I mean, I think there's a lot of, of misinformation. There's, and, and I think, you know, there's an epidemic of, there's an influence epidemic of information that is just as bad and, and disseminates as quickly as the virus itself. And I think we have to counteract it. And how do you do that is quite frankly something that we're just learning because the reality is that this is the first epidemic of social media, right? This is the first epidemic that all the information. I remember talking to uh, David uh, Sensor, who was a CDC director during the uh, 1976 flu epidemic swine flu. And I said, so David, how many times did you do a press conference? And he said, when we announced there was, he was a CDC director, said, when we announced there was a, pandem a, a flu pandemic, when we announced we were working a vaccine, when we announced that we're stopping the vaccine program because of, of, uh, of, uh, of Guillain-Barre complications, and when they fired me. You know, there were four press conferences. Nowadays, you know, Rich Besser, when he was a CDC director during the 2019 flu pandemic, he was in the news like every day. Nowadays, it's social media, right? It's Twitter, it's Facebook, and it's literally, our things are there continuously. So the reason I'm saying this is that you have to get engaged in combating misinformation and social media. You know, you have to, you have to get on the, on, the, on the mat. You have to go down to the mud and, 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 and combat that misinformation there quickly. I mean, the moment the president says, you know, Physicians are, you know, the media are, rig you know, rigging the system and they're calling deaths that don't exist and COVID is not as bad as it is. If you don't combat that by immediately getting on social media and counteracting that, it just spreads. You have to rapidly get out there. And what happened as a result of that? Well, as a result of that, very rapidly, AMA issued a statement, ACP issued a statement, a bunch of other, APHA issued a statement, a lot of other organizations have issued statements that they would have not normally done if it hadn't been for social media. Great. Um, so there's a question, a follow-up question about the advocacy that you mentioned. Um, so how do you suggest making it more accessible for community and public health professionals to get involved, given you know their own juggling or imbalancing of work and and life and you know, family? You get on the phone you write an email to your legislator or your congressional representative. It's actually, you know, at one time I was talking to a congressional uh, aide and I said, how do you guys make a decision? And he said, you know, we just look at, okay, if we have an, uh, something we're gonna vote on and we have a hundred vote against and two in favor, we probably will vote against. So it doesn't need to be compelling. You don't need to write great prose. You just need to say, this is a terrible idea and please vote for this. Uh, you know, dear Congressman such and such, I would strongly encourage you not to vote in favor of this law. I would strongly encourage you to really get involved in voting for, you know, COVID relief or whatever. And if they start getting a bunch of calls and emails about that, pretty soon they're going to pay attention because congressional people pay attention to their local voters. Now, if you have a story, if you have a story, they even like that more. They like a personal story. This woman in your district was about to lose her house, but thanks to the CARES Act, she was able to keep her house and stay employed and keep her kids in, in school, blah, 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 whatever you can say. They love those stories. That is something that gets to their heart. So you need to know how to talk to people and you talk to people by telling stories. You don't need to show p-values. You know, congressional aides are not epidemiologists. They don't give a shit about p-values but they want to hear stories. They want to hear life stories. And here's uh, another question similar to that, but on the other side of the token, 
if you have to educate the Latinx patients to be careful, that will give uh, an eye, uh, eye roll because that's not tangible for them and they cannot really do it. So uh, what do you recommend for uh, those who are seeing patients in the clinics and hospitals? You know, I, I think, I, at least I've been very effective by talking to them and you need to talk at their level. You need to ask them about, you know, what do they do, where do they work, what's the issue? And you need to tell them to pick figure out how to protect themselves. And again, telling people the most important thing you can do is when people say to me, what's the most important thing that I can do? And I said, the most important thing is don't get COVID, right? And it's really up to you. If you do the right things, you won't get COVID. So how do you protect yourself? And this is all about teaching people about, it's not, think about, you know, again, there's a lot of lessons here. Julia Marcus at Harvard has written a lot about this. Is not, it, I go back to the history of HIV, it's not telling people not to have sex, it's telling people how to have safe sex. Well, here is not telling people, no, you can't go out of your house. You have to tell them how to go out of your house in a safe way, what things you can do. You know, and again, I think it's been very easy to tell people what not to do. It's a lot harder to tell people what to do and how to do it safely. But telling people how to do things safely, I think it's very important and that's something we can do. Great. So there's a question about the vaccine trials. Um, if you think that there has been adequate representation of Latinos in those trials to be able to generalize the results um, of current well, known therapies to the population. Well, you know, first of all, yes, I do think that there's at least, at least some of the trials, I've been involved in the Moderna trial, and I think we have adequate representation of minorities. But I want to say something that it may be, it may be a heresy, but I'll say it. The main reason that you want to involve minorities is not because of generalizability. I have no evidence that the vaccine is going to work different in a Hispanic or a black or a white person. The main reason you want to do it is because when you're going to get the vaccine out there, you want to be able to say in this study that we already tested in your population, it works. It's all about, it's all about increasing trust. It's all about how do you generate trust. In fact, today I was talking to a group about how we're going to communicate during a vaccine if you, once you start the rollout of the vaccine. And one of the most important things is to get vaccine volunteers to be the spokespeople, right? The person that has already received a vaccine who's a Hispanic who can talk in Spanish and say, hey, I received the vaccine and it went fine and I'm doing well. I think that's the best person to speak up. It's not me. Is not you know Tony Fauci. The person that's going to convince that Hispanic is somebody that looks like them who's already received the vaccine. So the main reason, in fact, is not generalizability. It's actually, it's actually it's sort of expanding. It's actually rolling out. It's actually increasing trust because a lot of the issues that we're facing right now have to do with trust. And when trust is broken, public health doesn't work. Yes, so um, thanks for, for that answer. Uh, a few people ask if you could expand a little bit more about this new concept of getting herd immunity through health, uh, health equity, and how would you implement uh, this new movement, and how would you convince, so that I'm adding that, how would you convince the representatives that this is something that we have to do, and how would you test it? Well, I mean, I think there's several things. Number one, you know, what we're talking about here, what this, if you read this editorial, it's not my idea, somebody else's, but what they're talking about is, okay, how do we create a safety net so people that are sick can actually stay home? I mean, how do you make sure that that person who's an hourly wager, who is a, who is a, who is a wager, who is a cashier, who is a you know, low level employee who doesn't have any benefits, can stay home when they're, when they're sick so they don't come to work and infect others? No, that's created the social safety net that we in this country have not done a very good job of implementing. How do you ensure that people have access to health so they actually can get health care when they need it? They can get tested without difficulty. They can, you know, get the vaccine. And how do you do it? How do you provide people with, you know, I mean, let me put it this way. Something as simple as broadband internet access. I mean, we're having people do homeschooling in a country where many places don't have broadband internet. How do we ensure that the country builds the infrastructure so broadband internet in this country is not something that depends on where you live, it's actually something that is there. Things that can be done. And again, 
it's really about talking to Congress. It's really about talking to politicians. It's really about, about how do you prioritize spending. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is about your comment regarding uh, how um, policymakers aren't necessarily interested in p-values. So how do you balance, you know, between the research and the, you know, communication to policymakers and the community? You know, I think that one of the things that I, I, I think is really important to teach students in public health or in medicine is how to communicate to lay audiences. How do you translate a New England Journal of Medicine paper into, a, into something that is understandable, that is, a, that is a policy brief? How do you take, you know, I used to do this class in which I would take people and read the, uh, the 052 findings that, you know, antiretroviral therapy decreases HIV transmission and take that paper and I would do this exercise in the class that they would get the students that I would divide them into countries. And you would be the Minister of Health of, of Zambia or the Minister of Health of Zimbabwe or the Minister of the Economy of South Africa. And how do you take those findings and translate them into health policy briefs that you can go meet with that health minister or that, that cabinet minister that has plenty of other problems, but you can tell them that this is how these findings translate to the population. And I think teaching that translation of, of, of science into policy briefs, I think it's very important. Because first of all, those people can only read one page. So how do you get this information into one page that is readable, understandable? But second, how do you teach people to communicate this in a way that, as, as I tell people, it's almost like doing your elevator speech, right? I was able to get to the, on the elevator with, you know, the dean of the school or the, the minister of finance. How can I tell them that this, they have to listen to me? And it's again, being able to get that one minute is not with slides, it's not with, with PowerPoints, it's actually talking. It's actually talking with heart, with passion, but also with data, but data that you translate into the local community, into what matters to them. And maybe very important is translating into cost. Frequently a health minister is gonna say, okay, that sounds good, how much is that gonna cost me? Okay, you say antiretroviral therapy is gonna prevent transmission of HIV. If I treat all my HIV patients in this country, how much is that gonna cost? Me. You say that this COVID vaccine is effective. How much is it going to cost me to rule out this COVID vaccine? How much? And then you need to show people how to how to figure that out, right? And how to do cost effectiveness analysis. Great, thank you. Um, here, Elizabeth is asking if uh, you have seen any studies in the community that is identified as transient or that our experience is homelessness? Yeah, there's, there's a fair number of studies looking at COVID and homelessness, and some of them show increased risk, as you would expect. Some of them show actually decreased risk. And that's because, for example, here in Atlanta, very early on, we realized that homeless was gonna be a risky population. So we actually took all the homeless people that were diagnosed with COVID, and instead of sending them to the streets, so they can go to the homeless shelter and infect others. We actually put them out, up in hotels and we hired through the city hotel rooms and that's where they stayed. So in fact, transmission did not occur in shelters and we actually were able to control the pandemic. So I think it's again, giving homeless people a place where they can self-isolate was critical in controlling outbreaks in, in shelters. San Francisco has some really nice data on it as well. Excellent. It looks like we, um, that is the bulk of the questions. I'm wondering, Dean Samet, if you have uh, any follow-up questions? So, You're muted, John. Yeah. I just want to uh, mention something no, I was... I, uh, uh, I oh. think I'm good, Patty. I think, I, you know, uh, no, Carlos, this is terrific. I, can you put on one of your other hats for a moment and speak to equity globally? Yeah, no, uh, I, think that's, I think that's a great, really critical component. I think something that I thought a lot lately because of our different things, but I think when you have a global pandemic, uh, you know, it's not the time to think about, oh, we're gonna immunize everybody in the US and who cares what the rest of the world does? Because the reality is this, when you have a global pandemic, viruses don't pay attention to borders. 
And if you have a global pandemic raging in Europe or in Africa or wherever, it's going to impact our country. So I think, I think, you know, COVAX, I think a lot of the initiatives, I think this again goes to the fact that we have to be involved with WHO. We have to be involved at the global level in decision making. And the fact that the U.S. is not at this point in time, it's actually very disconcerting and very concerning for many of us. Because when you think about prior efforts in health, whether it's smallpox, whether it's HIV, it is that global collaboration. It is that collaboration without borders or national identity that really made a huge difference. And, and unfortunately, we are at a point right now in which not only the U.S., but the entire world, it's almost moved out to, we have retracted to a nationalistic attitude, right? So you have Russia and you have the UK and you have the US and you have everybody looking after themselves, but nobody's really thinking globally. And I think there's a huge need to reframe this because we do need, you know, you can have all the criticism you want of, of WHO, but the reality is that it is, plays a critical role in situations like this one, it plays a critical role in, in creating the, 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 the forum where these discussions can happen and when things like equitable distribution of vaccines can occur. No, I, I think uh, you're right. And the um, National Academy's report you mentioned on equitable allocation of vaccines, of course, takes on the global, uh, provides a global perspective um, as, um, as well. I think so far, perhaps we've been fortunate that the epidemic has not taken off in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, for, uh, for example, which is <laughs> been on my sort of watch list of uh, places of concern. Yeah, and it's, been, and it's been pretty interesting because it really has taken off, for example, as you know, in Latin America. Latin America has been heavily, heavily impacted, but Africa has not, and it's not because lack of testing. I mean, I've, you know, talking to John and Kennesong in, in the African CDC, they're clearly doing testing. They're just not having the number of cases that we're having in the US or in Latin America or in other places, and even Asia, the impact of Asia outside of, of India, it's actually pretty limited, quite frankly. Right. right. Yeah, no, I've been uh, surprised. I have <laughs> tight connections in uh, Japan and uh, life is essentially proceeding as normal uh, there uh, while we're facing so many challenges. I will say, um, should have sent you some Colorado uh, data, but if I were to show you um, incident case races, rates right now in Colorado, they would be and just like uh, all the plots you showed with the Latino population uh, too much in the lead over others. I wonder, um, Pat, Patty and Claudia, before we close, did Fernando uh, make it on? Is he with us or? No? I don't see him. I don't think that he was able to join, unfortunately. Well, it's, uh... I, I do have one, one last question um, with this integration and this problem of mental health uh, on the rise. And um, they are moving to a phase that is becoming uh, not so acute. The problem that we are having, the pandemic is becoming chronic with us, with so many other chronic diseases that we are facing. So uh, what do you see the efforts moving forward in integrating healthcare to uh, also tackle well, well, mental well, health? First of all, let me talk about chronic diseases because I think that's something that we really haven't mentioned. But you know, traditionally we have had this, again, this, this, this dichotomy between infectious diseases and chronic diseases. And I think it started even when we started looking at, you know, uh, we said, well, you know, th this epidemiological transition concept that in my mind sounded great, but it's actually pretty flawed and stupid. You know, no country has had an epidemiological transition, right? Infectious diseases are still raging while chronic diseases have taken off. So you actually have countries with double burden of disease. Uh, now we have actually what's even worse, right? The, a, lot of, a lot of the disease we're seeing is a result of chronic diseases. So I think one of the things that we need to come out of this is realizing that in our country and in many other countries, we're gonna have to address, seriously address its public health issues, epidemics of diabetes, hypertension, you know, uh, obesity, et cetera. Because if we don't, I mean, COVID-19 has clearly shown us that the biggest drivers of disease severity and mortality are these chronic diseases. And if we don't address them, then we're not addressing the epidemic. So, so I really think that 
thinking about an integrated approach of addressing chronic diseases as part of pandemic preparedness, I think would be something good that could come out of this, this, this problem. The second thing, yes, I mean, I think mental health issues in my mind are, are gonna be huge. And depression, uh, you know, anxiety, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we're gonna see. And, and somehow we need to, again, think about how we're gonna provide mental health and social support to, to millions of people, right? At the end of this pandemic. I mean, how are we gonna phase this, that, like the third wave or the fourth wave of this pandemic is gonna be a pandemic of, of, of depression, anxiety, and, and suicide and other things that we have to confront. So what, how do we look at, at mental health as a public health issue rather than a individual issues we looked about to this point. And, you know, think about that many of our states and many of our, in our country in general, we have pretty much, you know, I mean, we've pretty much sort of destroyed the public health or the, the public health approach to mental health. And what do we do with people that have mental health disorders? We put them in jail. That's a U.S. approach to mental health is we put you in jail. And we need to really rethink that, right? The approach to mental health is not incarceration. If I might ask a question, kind of looking forward, you referred to the election next week. And so I'm curious what, you know, we have two potential scenarios. One is a whole new administration in January. What would be the initial or the immediate steps that you think need to happen? And the second scenario is a continuance. And what do you think would happen in that case? So I think, you know, so assuming you've had a new administration, and I think you get a Biden administration, the first thing you're probably gonna see is much more of a science-based approach. I think, you know, one thing that you'll see is, you know, is, is listening to scientists and a more of a science-based approach. Uh, you're probably gonna see a, a national plan that up to this point, we have not had a national plan. And you're gonna see also a CDC that is empowered to do what it needs to do. And up to this point, the CDC has actually been, you know, crippled to its max, you know, CDC has essentially been removed from the, from the scene and has been used mostly as a, a scapegoat for the mistakes of the administration. And it's really hard for me locally here when I know these people and they're my friends to see the CDC essentially play a backseat in this epidemic, not because they want to, but because they have been put in that position. They have been essentially strong arm into that position. So I think those are gonna be the things you see immediately. There's not gonna be like, it's not like the curve is gonna flatten all of a sudden and it was gonna go away, but I think you're gonna be in a better track. I think the other thing, you know, if the current administration continues, I think what we really need to think is, is how do we, I think you need to think about what would the approach be. And, and then I think you have to come with an approach that is much, much more, uh, I think public health is going to lose. I think, you know, when you have somebody like Mark Meadows, the chief of staff saying, you know, we're not going to be able to defeat this disease and we're going to focus on treatment and vaccines. I think essentially what they're saying is we're going to be relying on big pharma and we're going to hope that we're going to get treatments and vaccines and that's going to be our salvation. And, and therefore what we need to do in public health is to focus on, on how do we educate. I mean, I think we need to stop trying to fight what's, a, what's a, a war we're not gonna win and figure out how do we work with the administration and the leadership. And I've been working already with the National Governor Association, for example, about how do we create a reasonable, rational approach to rolling out vaccines and to increasing vaccine uptake and acceptability once the vaccine becomes available. Because there is a role for public health to do that. So how do we just, just don't abdicate, but how do we say, okay, let's stop fighting for the things that we have, we're not gonna win, and what are the things that we can actually make a difference and how do we work together rather than fighting each other? What, what are the things that we in public health can bring to what will be the potential scenario, right? Well, I wonder, um, Patty and uh, Claudia, do you think, um, are we done with questions or are there more? I think, I think that we are done with the questions. Okay, well, I, you know, I, I'm sure, uh, Carlos, the conversation could just keep going and um, and I'm sorry it uh, can't and uh, but 
there'll be other um, opportunities. So I, I think on behalf of uh, our friend uh, Fernando and uh, everyone else, uh, you know, thank you for spending uh, time uh, with us, uh, bring us a terrific talk. But I, I think really important, I think, giving us all things to think about. And um, I think you touched on a whole range of considerations that hopefully our society will address uh, to um, bring the pandemic to, uh, to a close, because you're right. I mean, in general, health is not about pharma. It's not about vaccines. That's part of the story, of course, but it's about you know, all the issues that create uh, health equity, and we need to uh, be attacking them all. And I think the pandemic has clearly highlighted what we need to do. So again, um, thank you um, so much. And, um, and I know uh, Fernando, sorry he can't be with us. Well, listen, have a good evening. It's been a pleasure being with you. <laughs>